In a small cozy office, the curtains were drawn, enveloping the space in a pleasant semi-darkness. The air was filled with the scent of incense. A fortune-telling session was underway. Across from a young, pleasant, blue-eyed woman who didn't seem like a fortune teller at all sat a pregnant client, looking at her with both anxiety and hope. Catherine quietly said, Give me your hand and think about your problem. I'll try to see something. She first traced her fingers along the lines on the palm, closed her eyes, and concentrated, reading the lines of fate. Then she frowned, paled, recoiled. She shook her head and said, So, you say your husband left, the scoundrel? He doesn't want to raise the child? That's true, but it's not his child. Am I right? You had a romance with a tall, hazel-eyed brunette who was on a business trip. Your husband found out recently, had a big fight, and left. Is that correct? The client looked guilty and stunned at the fortune teller. Yes, that's exactly what happened. How did you know? Did you really see it from my hand? I don't even know who the baby's father is. And now my husband left and my lover went back to his wife. Does it mean I'm completely alone? I love my husband, really. That affair was just out of spite to get back at my spouse. I'm so scared. What will happen next? Will I really be raising the child alone? Catherine closed her eyes again, waved her hand. Images flashed before her eyes like frames on a reel. She regained her composure and said, No, you won't be alone. Your husband will forgive you and come back. He loves you too. But not immediately. It will happen after the baby is born. Don't push him. Give him time to forgive. The client thanked the fortune teller, handed over the money, and hurried away, smiling. Catherine breathed out and decided to take a break. She needed time to recover after each fortune-telling session. She took a sip of fragrant coffee and closed her eyes, trying to relax and regain herself. She inherited this gift from her beloved grandmother, Sarah. She was a well-known herbalist and fortune-teller in the whole area, and Catherine often visited her in childhood. She was very interested in everything her grandmother did. She taught her fortune-telling. She told her about reading the lines of fate and what could be learned from them. They collected herbs together. The girl liked everything very much, but there was no talk of any gift yet. You can't learn it. You either have it or you don't. For the first time, she realized she could see the future when they were chatting with her friend Rebecca, lying on the couch. Rebecca playfully offered her thin hand and said, Come on, tell me. Will I have a rich fiancé? When will I get married? Catherine read the line of fate as her grandmother had taught her, closed her eyes, concentrated. And suddenly an image appeared before her eyes, Rebecca in a wedding dress with their mutual friend Michael. The girl laughed and startled her friend. I see, you'll marry Michael. Whether he'll become rich or not, I don't know. Rebecca snorted and pouted. Your grandmother's talent didn't pass on to you. You said that just to annoy me, didn't you? I don't need that dork. He's a head shorter than me. And your jokes are stupid. But a year later, when they were dancing at Rebecca and Michael's wedding, everyone believed in Catherine's talent. Initially, only acquaintances came to her. Especially if the situation in life was difficult, everyone wanted to know their destiny. But the girl couldn't always see anything. There were moments when the gift seemed to disappear, especially when she herself was unwell. Yes, she couldn't predict anything for herself. She saw only darkness. After school, Catherine went to study psychology. It was close to her talent. And she also earned money by fortune-telling, renting a small office in a hotel. She didn't have a price list. Her grandmother strictly warned that it couldn't be done. 
Otherwise, the gift would disappear forever and trouble would come. Helping people should be selfless from the heart. But it's also not worth refusing sincere gratitude. So, whoever gave what, she was glad. Not so long ago, Catherine met Austin. He was also just starting out in his professional career, trying to develop a network business. Business was tough, and there weren't many clients yet. But the guy hoped that he would soon get on his feet, and business would pick up. They met completely by chance and in such an unusual way. Catherine was getting off the bus in winter, slipped, and fell into the snow, and Austin rushed to help her up, brushing her off like a gentleman. The girl took his hand to stand up, and then she felt a shock. She looked at him piercingly and said, Be careful, please. You don't need to go anywhere today, otherwise trouble will come. The guy was taken aback and countered. Are you a fortune teller? How do you know what will happen and what won't? Or is this an original way of introducing yourself? I'm flattered. But Catherine replied seriously. I'm just an ordinary girl, far from being a fortune teller. Sometimes I can see the future from the palm of your hand. Listen to me, I'm not joking, don't leave the house today. You'll thank me tomorrow. If anything, here's my business card. They said goodbye. Austin chuckled, thinking the girl just wanted to be original. He liked her. But on the same day, he was indeed invited to a birthday party by an acquaintance. But for some reason, he didn't feel like going, and he declined, citing tiredness and busyness. And when he found out the next day how the drunken party ended, he immediately remembered yesterday's acquaintance. At that birthday party, there was a big fight, and the police were called. It turns out that chance acquaintance saved him from trouble, and she wasn't a charlatan at all. The guy was impressed and decided to find her to thank her. That's how they started as friends and then started dating, falling in love with each other. He didn't give her luxurious bouquets or sing serenades. He simply loved her quietly and faithfully, always being there for her. Catherine valued what she had, as she had already experienced difficult relationships with her previous boyfriend, which ended in a breakup. Therefore, she cherished her relationship with Austin. They hardly ever quarreled. They started living together. Everything would have been fine, but both of them really wanted children they were already nearing 30. But at the beginning of their relationship, Catherine honestly told her fiancé that she could never have children she was infertile. The problem arose when she was still with her first fiancé and tried to get pregnant. But doctors put an end to her after thorough examination. She would never have children, period. Because of this, her first boyfriend left her. Because of her diagnosis, Catherine was deeply troubled, feeling different from everyone else. Like an empty vessel. The thought of Austin possibly not being able to bear it and leaving her was unbearable to her. But Austin wasn't like that. He sincerely loved her and accepted her as she was. He often reassured her and promised to be there, no matter what happened. Although deep down, of course, he also dreamed of children. A year passed. They lived well, hardly ever argued. And they decided to legalize their relationship, get married. They also decided to adopt a child from an orphanage to raise and love as their own. To give their life meaning, because it is for the sake of children that we strive and achieve something in life. Catherine decided to go to the orphanage with Austin to take a look. She insisted. Let's not guess whether it will be a boy or a girl. The heart, I think, will guide us. Lead us to a son or a daughter. They had been chatting with the children in the nursery for about an hour. Catherine was almost in tears. She felt so sorry for these little ones. They were already unwanted by anyone. 
the children cuddled up to Catherine and Austin, vying for attention, telling them about themselves, asking to play. The woman was at a loss. She didn't know whom to choose. Austin was stunned. He had never imagined there were so many destitute, unhappy children in the world. And then Catherine saw a little, skinny, almost emaciated boy about five years old. He was sitting on the floor under the table, looking somewhere with a detached gaze, not reacting to the visitors. It seemed like he was not interested in what was happening in the nursery, and it was very strange. Catherine decided to cheer him up a bit. Bending down to him, she asked, Hey, Sunshine, what's your name? Come to us on the couch. It's fun and there are lots of gifts. Don't be sad. Do you want an apple or a chocolate candy? The boy turned to her, his eyes filled with indescribable sadness like that of an adult. He remained silent, sighed heavily, and turned away again. The woman didn't expect such a reaction at all. She and Austin exchanged glances and decided to inquire about this child with the head of the orphanage. She immediately tried to dissuade them. If you're talking about Carl, I don't advise taking this child. He's very sickly. He has a whole bouquet of problems. He hardly speaks, stutters. And things aren't smooth with his mother either. It will be hard for you with him. Austin has been with us for two years already, and there's been no progress. He still avoids both children and adults and doesn't make any contact. He lives in his own world and doesn't let anyone in. Apparently, some strong psycho-emotional trauma has affected him. Catherine persisted, this little one, who looked like an old man, had touched her soul. Can we talk to him alone? Well, at least try, please. The head of the orphanage shrugged. It's up to you, give it a try. But it's all futile. Everyone has tried, doctors, psychologists, all in vain. The boy was brought into the office. The head of the orphanage tactfully left. The boy sat on the edge of the chair and looked at the couple with distrust and fear, like a wolf cub ready to retreat into deep defense. Catherine cautiously tried to smile at him, but the little one immediately frowned, indicating that he didn't want to meet. The woman didn't give up and began to speak quietly, as if not to him, but out loud. Carl, my name is Catherine, and my husband's name is Austin. We came here to find our beloved son. We would love him, take care of him. I would read him fairy tales, and Austin would teach him to ride a bike. I really want you to become our beloved son. And we're getting married soon. You'll see mom and dad looking beautiful, all dressed up, and we'll become a real happy family. I feel like my heart led me right to you. Tell me, would you like to live with us as a family, or do you want to stay here? The boy suddenly looked at her intently, almost like an adult, and timidly reached out his little hand to her. He even smiled a little. The woman almost cried. She understood the ice had been broken. And Carl made contact, which meant he didn't mind. She stroked his head and said, I want you to know Austin and I won't abandon you here. We'll take you and love you. Do you believe me? Nod. Please, sweetheart, will you wait for us? The boy nodded, and finally, he said his first words in all this time. I don't feel well here. I want to go home. Come back soon, Mom. Tears poured from Catherine's eyes. She no longer held back her emotions, hugged the little boy tightly, and realized he was her child. She deliberately decided not to read his palm, let everything be as fate intended. But for herself, she understood they wouldn't look at anyone else. Austin also liked the boy. He felt so sorry for him. Yes, they would have to work hard, take care of him. The child was obviously very neglected and scared. But they hoped he would thaw eventually. To give him a happy childhood. 
Suddenly, Austin noticed a pendant around the boy's neck. It could be seen through the collar of his shirt. The man was surprised. Where did the orphan get such an ornament? And with interest, he asked, What an interesting trinket. Can I see it? Where did you get it from? Well, well, I have the same one, silver, with a horse. Look, here. We have two completely identical pendants, you and I. How's that? Let's compare. Catherine was amazed when she saw her husband holding two identical pendants in his hands. He told everything. They asked the boy, Carl, can you tell us where you got this pendant from? Do you remember? The boy nodded. My mom gave it to me. The one I lived with before. She was good, kind, she loved me. Tears welled up in Catherine's eyes, and she cautiously asked, And what happened to your mom? How did you end up in the orphanage? Do you remember anything? Carl suddenly covered his face with his hands and started crying, stuttering heavily from excitement. I don't know. She disappeared. And strange ants took me to the orphanage. I cried and longed so much, but the nanny kept telling me that my mom left me and would never come back. That I should accept it and get used to it. But I don't believe her. She's lying. They're all lying. My mom would never leave me. I think maybe she died, and they just don't tell me. The boy cried bitterly and helplessly, clinging trustingly to Catherine. She stroked his light hair and whispered, All right, don't cry. Don't be upset, my little one. Everything's behind us now. Papa and I will love you and take care of you. And we won't let anyone hurt you, I promise. The head of the orphanage was quite surprised when she saw him interacting with Catherine. No one had achieved such success before. Apparently, fate itself brought them to him. So she decided not to delay with the guardianship procedure. The boy would be better off in a family than in an orphanage. While the commission was reviewing the documents, Catherine and Austin often visited the little boy. They talked a lot to help him get used to them faster. The boy reached out to them and eagerly awaited when they would finally take him home. A month later, the couple already took Carl home. At first, he was very shy, but he gradually got used to it. They celebrated the wedding with their son. It was not lavish at all, only close relatives and friends were invited. The parents were not at all against Catherine and Austin taking the boy from the orphanage. On the contrary, they warmly congratulated the newlyweds and wished them patience and success in raising him. Catherine was so happy that day because all her dearest dreams had come true. She married the man she loved and became a mother. Just the word woman she relished. She couldn't even believe it. After the celebration, when everything settled down and the leisurely routines resumed, Austin firmly said, I still don't understand. How could Carl and I end up with identical pendants? They're handmade, and you can't find ones like them for sale. I'll go talk to my parents tomorrow and get to the bottom of this mystery. It's been bothering me. After all, my pendant was a birthday gift from my father when I was little. It's just unbelievable that you happen to choose that same boy with the same pendant as mine. Without even knowing it. The next day, Austin went to see his parents. Lately, he hadn't visited them as often, family, responsibilities. They were very happy to see him. His mother set the table, and his father became interested in talking about family and work. He learned the news about their adopted son. And then Austin got to the main point. Dad, Mom, look at these two pendants. One is mine, the one you, Dad, gave me. And the other was around the neck of our son when we adopted him. How is this possible? 
Dad, you've told me a hundred times that you had a custom made for me as a one of a kind. Please, tell me the truth. An awkward pause ensued. The father and mother exchanged worried glances, hesitated, as if weighing whether to speak or not. His mother couldn't bear it any longer. Why are you looking at me like that, Stephen? It's time, apparently, to confess to your son, not just to me. Why are you silent? Tell him, it's your sin. Austin didn't understand anything. His father sighed and began to speak, realizing there was no other way. Staying silent wouldn't work. It was a long time ago. We had just gotten married with Laura. I loved her deeply, but we were so different. We argued often, clashed. Well, a demon got the better of me. I started a relationship on the side with another woman. Carol was her name. I thought it was nothing serious. And then I got carried away, started living between two families. Laura, of course, found out everything and gave me a good talking to, especially that she was pregnant. I had no idea. But I'm not some kind of scoundrel to leave a child fatherless, so I broke it off with that woman, chose your mother. And as a keepsake, I gave her that same pendant. And the second one to your mother. Well, as a symbol that I loved them both. Well, don't look at me like that. Who doesn't have sins? I don't know anything else about Carol. I lived my whole life with Laura. Thank God, she forgave me eventually. Yes, I reproached myself afterward when the infatuation passed. I know it was wrong. Austin looked at his father in shock. Well, father, you and mother have always been a model family for me, and here's what comes out. I'm shocked, to be honest. But if the little one has the pendant, does that mean he's related to me? If theoretically we assumed that this Carol was also pregnant with you, how else would he have gotten it? The father waved his hands and crossed himself. No, no. That's impossible. Carol wasn't pregnant with my child, I'm sure. She had some issues with that. I remember for sure. Austin asked for the address where Carol used to live and decided to go there. Maybe she still lived there? The story with the pendant was getting more and more complicated and therefore more interesting. At the specified address, Austin found an old abandoned house. Clearly, no one had lived there for a long time. Grass grew waist high, the fence had collapsed and the lock on the door was completely rusted. He called out to a neighbor who was walking home from the store. Hello, can you tell me where the woman who used to live here moved to? Carol? I really need to find her. It's important. The woman shook her head sadly. Carol passed away. God rest her soul. It's been about ten years now. So, you won't be able to talk to her for sure. She was seriously ill, suffered for a long time. We did everything we could to help her until the end. She had no relatives. The whole street pitched in for her funeral. Austin asked. That's a shame. Did she have any children? A husband? A family? Surely, she wasn't completely alone? Is that even possible? The neighbor sighed. Carol never got married, and she didn't have any children, that's for sure. With her illness, it was impossible. She lived alone, a real loner. She just fed stray cats and dogs. She was a good woman, kind-hearted. Austin left. He no longer understood anything. What was the connection between himself, his adopted son, and dependent if Carol had no children? What an intrigue, indeed. In the evening, when Carl was already asleep, Austin told Catherine everything. She pondered. Well, what a mystery of the century. Straight out of some detective story. We need to find out more about this Carol. 
Surely, she had friends, acquaintances, maybe she worked somewhere. Perhaps then we'll have a clue to the solution? Right now, it's all dark woods. Suddenly, her husband asked, Listen, Catherine, you're a fortune teller. Can't you see something about Carl from his palm? Try. The woman immediately refused, I won't, don't even try to persuade me. Firstly, my gift doesn't seem to work with my close ones, it's been tested a hundred times. And secondly, who knows what I might see there. No, let everything go as it's meant to be. I've already paid enough for my grandmother's talent with my infertility. I don't want to invite trouble again. But the mystery of the pendant still bothered Austin, and he went back to Carol's neighbors, hoping to find out something more about her. He was lucky. He struck up a conversation with a neighbor who lived opposite Carol. Her name was Gloria, and she remembered something important. Carol didn't really have many friends. Rarely did anyone come to visit her. She was generally secretive, closed off. And when she got really sick, the only one who came to her was our hospital orderly, Abigail. She works in the therapeutic department, exactly. Carol couldn't afford to hire a nurse to administer injections and IVs. And Abigail took the job cheaply. She was glad for every penny. So, she went to her for a long time, almost until her death. And she attended the funeral. Of course, why wouldn't she? She cried. It was clear she had grown attached. So, that orderly has a little boy, a son. She brought him a couple of times, probably had no one else to leave him with. But other than that, I don't remember anyone else. Oh, may she rest in peace. It's so sad she died so young. Austin came home with this news. He told everything to Catherine and suddenly asked, What do you think, dear, should we even continue digging and look for this orderly? Or should we just forget about it and raise our son? What does it matter who his mother was and where that pendant came from? We might just be digging ourselves into more trouble. What if Carl's mother didn't die? What if she wants to take our son back? What will we do then? The child is wonderful. He's only just started to come to life. I wouldn't want to test his psyche again. Catherine thought for a long time, weighing everything, and then replied, You're right. Of course, Austin. It's easier not to know anything. Live peacefully, raise our little boy. But you know I'm superstitious. Think about it yourself. Wasn't it fate that I chose Carl at the orphanage? And he reached out to me. The head of the orphanage said he hadn't made contact for two years. Maybe it's a sign of fate for us to see the pendant and help him find his mother? Remember how the boy spoke about his mommy. With such love, tenderness. It doesn't seem like his mother was completely lost. No, let's see this through. Whatever will be, will be. If we find out that Carl's mother has died, or that she doesn't want her son, then we'll calm down and continue living. But otherwise, this mystery will keep tormenting us and not let us rest. Having secured his wife's support, Austin went to the department where Abigail worked. First, he approached the duty nurse and began to inquire, Good day, how can I find Abigail? She works as an orderly here. I really need to talk to her. Can you help? What shift is she on? The nurse grimaced for some reason and replied angrily, No. She doesn't work here anymore. She quit. If you're done, leave. This isn't a place for socializing. Look at the queue of patients I have. Austin was disappointed. The last thread was cut. What to do? Where to find Abigail now? He didn't know her address. No one here would give it to him. It was a dead end. And then, an elderly orderly caught up with him. She grabbed his sleeve and pushed him into the utility room. She whispered in a jumbled manner. 
I know everything about Abigail. Don't believe Stacy, she lies. Abigail didn't quit herself. She was accused of stealing drugs and got sentenced. I can't say exactly where she's serving time. Seems like it's in the city. But she didn't take anything, you understand. The head set her up. He had a crush on her, but she refused him. Not only that, she found out about his shady dealings, wanted to go to the police. So, he got rid of her. And in such a way that no one would ever believe her. He framed her as a thief and pinned his own schemes on her. Abigail is a good woman. You sort it out there, she's not guilty. She's doing time for someone else's sins, poor soul. It's not right. Austin perked up and asked. She had a son, though, a boy. What happened to him? Where is he now? The nurse replied. We know where they took the shelter. They don't have any relatives. So now the boy is in the shelter without his mom. That scoundrel, our supervisor, has been ruining people's lives for his whole life. And what's more? He doesn't even feel guilty. He lives carefreely. Austin thanked the talkative old lady and slipped her some money. He already knew what he would do next. He would postpone all his affairs and go to the colony. He had to find out everything, talk to this Abigail, reassure her that her son was fine, that Carl was with them. It's incredible how much suffering fell on her lot. Catherine supported her husband and packed everything for him, a thermos with tea, sandwiches, warm clothes. And she stayed at home with their son. Carl became more attached to her, ate well, stopped crying at night. Even his stuttering almost disappeared. The boy loved to draw. It was his favorite activity. Catherine bought him paints, an album, and the boy happily spent hours drawing pictures. Mostly they were animals or cars, but often the same grim drawing flashed, spears, arrows flying from everywhere, and some incomprehensible figure lying on the ground. Catherine understood that this drawing somehow related to his past. But remembering her son's recent painful reaction to inquiries, she didn't pry into his soul, tried to make him think less about the bad. They walked in the park for a long time. Carl was a calm, thoughtful boy. He didn't like running around like many children. He adored feeding pigeons and also feeding stray kittens. They deliberately took soft pâtés with them and fed the kittens born behind the pizza kiosk. Carl picked up a tiny kitten, stroked it gently, and whispered, You're so cute. Eat, I brought this for you. I'll come back tomorrow. Will you wait for me? Catherine couldn't stand it. Her heart was squeezed. She felt so sorry for the foundling. She asked her son, Carl, would you like us to take one for ourselves to live with us? Choose which one you like best. The little one even shouted with joy and hugged Catherine with his warm little hands. Thank you, Mom. Of course, I want to. I was just shy to say it. Let's take this one, the gray one. He's so cute with a white tie on his chest. Let's call him Fluffy. He's so fluffy. I'm so happy. Now I'll have the best friend. Listen, Mom, what about his brothers and sisters? Mom doesn't come to them. They won't be able to do it on their own. They'll die, right? I feel so sorry for them. Catherine felt ashamed. Her little son turned out to be kinder and more responsive than she was. She immediately replied, Well, we can't take them all with us at once. Let's take them to the animal shelter. There, they'll surely find good owners for them, and they won't be lost. Carl suddenly looked at her very grown-up and asked, What about me, huh? My mom must have died, right? And they found me a new mom, you, so I wouldn't get lost. I'm good with you, mommy, and dad is cool too. I love you. 
We'll always be together, right? I don't want to go back to the shelter. It's so bad there. But you know, sometimes I miss that mom. Catherine couldn't hold back and burst into tears. Emotions overwhelmed her. She hugged the little one, pressed him to her, and tried to calm him down. What are you talking about, baby? Are you a kitten? You are and daddy's most beloved little man. We'll be together forever now. Don't worry, nobody will send you to the shelter. What? We'd be lost without you, me and dad. And that you miss your mommy, that's normal, you loved her. It's okay, everything will be fine. Together we'll manage. Well, take Fluffy, and I'll carry the others in a box. Let's go find homes for our Fluffy gang. We'll need to buy everything for the pet. So much to do. The little one immediately distracted from sad thoughts and started chattering, which litter box to choose, which bowl, what food they would feed Fluffy with, and how surprised Dad would be when he returned. Catherine cheerfully answered him, but something unimaginable was happening in her soul. She thought, Lord, what happened in the life of this little boy that at five he reasons like an old man seasoned by life? Where did his mother disappear to? It's clear that he was strongly attached to her and loved her. So she's clearly not a drunkard or a lost cause. Some tragedy must have happened. No, Austin and I must get to the truth. I won't be able to live peacefully until I find out what happened to his mother, who she is, and where she is. Meanwhile, Austin was talking to the head of the colony in distant Tver. He was saying, You're late, sir. Abigail died two months ago along with other prisoners in a fire. True, a couple of people escaped, but they will be caught for sure it's just a matter of time. Abigail's body was badly burned. It was impossible to recognize her. They only identified her shirt with a number on the patch. So, I can't help you with anything. The visitor interpreted the fortune teller's fear in her own way and almost shouted, What did you see? Don't be silent. Something bad happened to my son, right? Is he alive? Please, tell me the truth. I'm exhausted. Catherine sighed and firmly replied, Your son is alive, don't worry. I know where he is living now. Catherine hesitated to say the most important thing, stumbled on a half-word. Abigail looked at her with such hope, tears glistened in her eyes, and the fortune teller made up her mind. It so happened that my husband and I recently took a boy from the shelter. I am barren. And that turned out to be your Carl. My husband noticed a special pendant on his neck. He has the same one. That's how it all started. We began to unravel the mystery of the pendant. It's a long story. In short, my husband Austin was recently in the colony. They told him that you had died. Abigail cried. She grabbed the fortune teller's hand and begged her. Are you telling the truth? Is Carl with you? Oh God, what happiness. I found my little son. Please, let me have just one glance at him. I'll kneel if you want. I only decided to run away for him. I know they'll find me anyway, but I couldn't live, sleep, or eat without my son. I decided, they may find me, kill me, tear me apart alive, I don't care. Just let me see my son. Tell me, does he call you mom? And he probably forgot me, it's been two years, right? The fortune teller said, Carl is a wonderful boy. He calls us mom and dad. He loves. Poor thing, he barely recovered from the shelter life. It was hard for him there. But he remembers you, just not everything. But he said several times that he loves his mom, misses her. I don't know what to do, honestly. Can I call my husband, consult with him? Catherine couldn't resist. She called Austin at work and told him everything. 
he rushed over immediately. He bombarded Abigail with questions. Tell me, how did you end up in prison? I talked to the nurse in your ward. She's sure you're not guilty. And how did you manage to survive at all? In the colony, they're convinced you're dead. Abigail sighed heavily and began to tell everything. You ask how I got the pendant? It's simple. I took care of a sick woman named Carol for a long time. She had almost no money to pay me. So, she gave me this little pendant. And later I put it on my son Carl when they took me away. I was just a simple nurse, tried to help people, didn't slack off. But it so happened that our supervisor started pursuing me and forced me to sleep with him. He was quite the ladies' man, didn't miss a single skirt. Many girls agreed to such things and endured it because they didn't want to lose their jobs. But I couldn't, I resisted in every way. And one day I saw Vincent pocketing medications, strong narcotics, and tranquilizers. And they were accountable. He then sold them for big money. So, in anger, I blurted out to him that if he didn't leave me alone, I would tell everything to the police and end his career. If only I knew how it would all end, I would never have done it. And that scoundrel immediately twisted everything around and framed me a week later. I don't know who put those drugs in my bag, but he openly took them out and called the police. And then he pinned everything on me behind my back. They gave me three years. I've already served two and a half. Austin was amazed. So, why did you run away? You don't have much time left. And now they'll start looking for you. Although they are convinced you burned to death. But how will you live if according to the documents you're dead? Then it gets even worse, a person invisible. You won't be able to get documents, get a job. Abigail sighed heavily and continued. Yes, I didn't intend to run away. Where would I go? It was our Melissa who decided she just had to get out. So, she started the fire in the dining room. A commotion started, everything caught fire instantly. And I just happened to be there. Well, and I thought, what if this is my only chance to find my son? You don't know, can't imagine what it's like to be strangled almost every night for almost two years, beaten professionally to leave no traces. I've been in the prison hospital twice with a concussion, stabbed once with a knife. Yes, and you say it's been half a year there. Yes, I was simply afraid I wouldn't live to the end of my term. So, I took off my shirt with the patch and sneaked into the kitchen and climbed into the truck that carried our stitched mattresses. I'm not that tall, two heads shorter. So, they didn't notice me in the mattress during the inspection. That's how I managed to escape, but what's the use? I didn't even know where they took my son, what happened to him, where to look for him. She wandered the streets and all. And then she stumbled upon your advertisement, claiming you could help see the future. I've never really believed in such things, but somehow my feet brought me here. And not in vain. The woman fell to her knees and began to plead again. Please, let me see my son. I love him more than life itself. I ran for him. I just want to hug him, hold him, and kiss him. Kiss my little one. Austin helped her up and replied, Yes, understand us, Abigail, we're not against you seeing Carl. But think about it. Do you think it's a good idea right now? The boy has just calmed down, stopped being wild and withdrawn, started interacting with other kids. And now imagine, you come and tell him you're his mother. Of course, the boy will be happy, thrilled even. But then what? No matter how you look at it, you'll have to confess to serve your sentence. You'll disappear again for six months, and what about Carl? He'll see it as a double betrayal, don't you understand? 
Once his mom vanished, he barely survived that. And just as she's found, she vanishes again? Abigail fell silent, pondering for a long time. Maybe you're right, I won't be able to hide for long. And you can't live without documents. So what should I do? I won't return to prison until I see Carl. Catherine came up with a solution. You've changed a lot on the outside. Carl probably won't recognize you now. Let's go to our house. I'll say you're an acquaintance of mine. You can spend some time with your son without revealing the truth. Deal? Austin added. And in the meantime, I'll find you a good lawyer. They'll help ensure you don't get additional time, as they could charge you with escape. I promise we'll tell Carl the truth together, but later, when he's a bit older, so as not to traumatize him. Reluctantly, Abigail agreed, better this way than nothing. After all, the couple could have just turned her away. She's as good as dead now, nobody and with no rights to Carl anymore. It was horrible to realize. She entered the house on trembling legs. Carl was drawing under the nanny's watchful eye. Seeing Catherine and Austin, he happily ran to them. Hooray! Mom, Dad are here. I missed you so much. Oh, and who's this? We have guests? Catherine delicately replied. Yes, sweetie, Aunt Abigail, my good friend. She'll stay with us for a little while, visit. The boy looked at Abigail so thoughtfully, so intently, as if trying to remember something. Her heart sank, and a lump formed in her throat. She so wanted to hug, kiss, and cuddle her dear son. But remembering Austin's words, she kept her promise and refrained from doing so. But it was so hard for her. The woman just smiled tousled the boy's curly hair, and lovingly said, Hi there, let's be friends. Will you show me your drawings? Wow, they're beautiful. Carl immediately started showing her, but still looked at Abigail as if trying to recall something. Her voice seemed familiar to him, but he couldn't remember from where. Nonetheless, Carl immediately warmed up to her, reaching out to her. Obviously, subconsciously feeling a connection. In the evening, Abigail read him a bedtime story and tucked him in, then went to the kitchen and started crying, covering her face with her hands. Catherine and Austin tried to comfort her. Abigail, what happened? Everything seemed fine. You saw your son. Why are you crying? The woman muttered incoherently. I'm so hurt. So upset that Carl didn't recognize me. He remembered something, but didn't recognize his own mother. But why be surprised? When they took him away, he was only three. How he cried. Screamed until he was hoarse. They literally tore him away from me. Prison doesn't paint anyone. My voice is permanently hoarse now. Endless bronchitis took its toll and my face is disfigured from the fire. You can't imagine how unbearable it is for me now. How I wish I could close my eyes and everything would be as it was before, just me and my son, no troubles. Austin sighed and replied softly. Unfortunately, it won't work out that way. But you need to believe that all the good is still ahead. You need to go back and finish your sentence, and don't worry about your son. As you can see, he's doing well with us, and he's like a beacon of light for us. We've grown very attached to Carl, loved him with all our hearts, and the thought of parting with him is unbearable for us. Understand us too. But as hard as it is for us, Catherine and I understand that a mother is a mother, and we won't stand in the way of your communication. I ask one thing, let Carl grow up, let things settle in your life. And then we'll all tell him the truth. Otherwise, if we do it right now, he'll shut down again, stop trusting people. Abigail wiped away bitter tears and replied softly. You're right, 
I have no other way out. Although I bear the cross for someone else's sins, it seems to be my destiny. And thank you, kind people, for taking my son from the shelter. I can imagine what he went through there. After all, Carl has always been such a homebody, such a quiet little boy. He even hated kindergarten, let alone the shelter. Austin persuaded Abigail, and she relented. Thanks to the experienced lawyers they hired, she wasn't given additional time. Moreover, he managed to secure decent conditions for her. They stopped tormenting Abigail, and after six months of imprisonment, she finally walked free. To be close to her son all the time, Catherine allowed her to work as a nanny at their home. The woman was happy. Now she could see her little boy every day, know how he was doing, talk to him, and love him. Catherine and Austin couldn't leave Abigail in trouble. Together, they raised money and arranged for corrective surgery on her face. Now her appearance wasn't as repelling as before. Surprisingly, the newlyweds became very close with Abigail, even though the situation didn't initially suggest it. After all, they would eventually have to give Carl back to his mother, and they couldn't imagine how to do it, as they had long since fallen in love with this serious, smart little boy. But regardless, they saw that Abigail was a very good woman and truly loved her son. She just had bad luck, encountering a scoundrel who broke her fate, separating her from her own child. And they had no moral right to deprive her of motherhood. Austin and Catherine helped her fix up her own little home. They did fresh renovations, re-wallpapered, now it was livable with a child. The question of employment remained open. It was very difficult, as no one was eager to hire Abigail with a criminal record, not even as a janitor. So Austin hired her as a janitor at his company. Abigail was now responsible for providing the office with stationery, water, kitchen supplies, and ensuring all faucets and appliances were working. She worked very hard, was grateful to these people who did so much for her. And of course, she counted the seconds until they would tell Carl everything and she would take him home. The boy started first grade, and all three of them took him there, Catherine, Austin, and Abigail. Each of them was very worried about their first grader, how he would adjust to the class, whether he would like his first teacher. But everything went great. The boy went to school with pleasure, brought back good grades. He had long since become attached to Abigail, did homework with her, shared his sorrows and joys. And at the family council, they decided they couldn't wait any longer. They had to tell Carl the truth. And not torture each other. It was unbearable. At night, Catherine cried into her pillow, realizing that soon Abigail would take Carl back and she and Austin would be alone again. It was very difficult to imagine. Carl was playing with toy soldiers when all three of them entered his room, Abigail, Catherine, and Austin. As the head of the family, Austin took it upon himself to start such a difficult and important conversation with the little boy. He began cautiously, his voice trembling. Son, we want to tell you something very important. We found your birth mother, the one you lived with before the shelter. She didn't abandon you or die, as we thought. Just a mean uncle put her behind bars, but all these years she loved you, never forgot, and missed you terribly. Tell me, would you like to see her? Carl immediately perked up, his eyes lit up, and he exclaimed loudly, Is that true? Mom's alive? I knew it. She couldn't have left me. Where is she? Abigail couldn't hold back and rushed to her son. I am your mother, sweetheart. I love you. Remember how I sang you a song about the bear? How we built a snowman in the yard? How I called you my little kitten? It's not my fault we were separated, and I'm very grateful to your new mom and dad for taking you from the shelter. Come to me, my little one. Let me finally hug you. 
Carl immediately went to her, now he remembered where he had heard her voice before. He even cried from surprise and overwhelming joy. Along with him, Catherine couldn't hold back her tears, her soul was in complete turmoil. On the one hand, she was happy that mother and son were finally together. But on the other hand, she had sincerely grown fond of the boy, had become attached to him, and couldn't imagine how she would live without him now. Yes, and Austin was very sad too. He had already grown so used to the boy living with them, calling him dad, and taking care of him had really brought the family together. How would they now live without their little mischief maker? The farewell was difficult. Catherine promised Carl that they would see each other often, be friends, but she felt an unbearable pain of loss in her heart. Yes, the boy was also confused. He had gotten used to his foster parents, and it was sad to leave them. But he also longed for his mother. On edge, Catherine fell seriously ill. The house suddenly felt empty, with no one to care for, to check homework, to play with. She was overwhelmed with such melancholy that she had no appetite, lost her appetite, and felt nauseous to the point of vomiting. She completely abandoned fortune-telling. What good was it when her own destiny was crumbling, and she couldn't help herself? Her gift was gone. She saw nothing else. Austin couldn't bear to see his wife suffering without tears, and one evening he said firmly, This can't go on like this anymore. We're going to the doctor tomorrow. You look so pale, you're like a shadow wandering around. You're torn apart all the time, this is no joke anymore. I love you, darling, no matter what. I don't want to lose you. As if we needed another illness. We have to accept everything that has happened and move on, do you understand? Well, do you want to go back to the shelter, maybe adopt another child? Catherine shook her head vigorously and replied with only her lips, No, I don't want anything. Why do you need me, Austin? I'm worthless, an empty shell, I can't even give you a child. I managed to choose Carl at the shelter, the one with a living mother who loves him. And now I've lost my son. I don't want to live. And turning away to the wall, she burst into bitter tears. Her husband understood that it was useless to argue with her now. So he just wrapped her up like a child in a blanket and gently stroked her, thinking to himself, you silly thing. I only love you. Still, despite her resistance, Austin took Catherine to the hospital. He couldn't sit still in the hospital corridor while his wife was being examined. Time seemed to stand still. Then the doctor came out and said sternly, Come into the office. I know what's causing your wife's illness. Everything inside the man tightened, and images flashed through his mind, one scarier than the other. But he decided for himself, whatever happened, he would fight together with Catherine for her health. His wife lay on the couch, pale, frightened, and stunned, staring at the monitor. Austin stood beside her, and the doctor moved the sensor around, saying, See this little spot in the corner? That's your baby. Your wife is pregnant, which, given her diagnosis, can only be called a miracle. Congratulations. Nausea and morning sickness are normal at early stages, as a sharp mood swings due to hormonal changes. I'll prescribe her vitamins and medications to improve her condition. So... Expect a little one and take care of your wife. No stress, only rest and positive emotions. All the best. I'll see you in a month for a checkup. Austin couldn't believe it. Catherine was also crying. She had long resigned herself to being barren. And now such happiness. They would have a baby. Such a long-awaited, cherished, and loved one. Their mood soared to the heavens, and they wanted to shout their joy to the whole world. Austin's mind was filled with only one thought, I will soon be a father. And little feet will pitter-patter in our home again. And even if we don't sleep, 
I'm ready to never let go of my little one. He surrounded Catherine with so much attention, care. He revolved around her. And she bathed in love, eagerly awaiting the birth of their baby. Of course, they told Abigail and Carl everything. The woman sincerely rejoiced for the couple and breathed a sigh of relief. Thank God. Now my conscience will stop tormenting me, finally. I've been worried all along that, inadvertently, I caused you suffering. After all, you've grown accustomed to and loved Carl, and now everyone will be happy. And you'll have your own little baby. It's a gift from God, no less. Catherine decided never to engage in fortune-telling again and to focus only on her family. After all, that's the most important thing in life. And what and how things should happen is not for us, humans, to decide. Everything is the will of God. 